Welcome to the Grace Vineyard Podcast, where we are building growing communities of worshipers who are becoming like Christ, empowered to do His work. We hope you enjoy this message. My name is Ron, if I haven't met you, and I'm going to be um, opening the Bible and bringing some teaching today. It's, a, it's kind of an equipping teaching. So are you ready to be trained? Yeah. <laughs> did, I hear, did I hear laughter over here? Like, yeah. Uh, we are, we're doing a series, um, and this would be the third week in this series. Um, in this situation, pretty much every one of the episodes can stand alone. Um, there, it's not so much a cliffhanger every week, but you can, you know, like when you read through a book of the Bible. We're looking at the fact that May 28th is the day of Pentecost. Do, do any of you know what the day of Pentecost is? Was that a no? That might just change the teaching right now to something else. Does anyone know what Pentecost is? Who, who knows what Pentecost is? Show me your hand so I could see... Ah, some, some not, well, most, okay. Is everyone shy today? Maybe we need to put more caffeine in the coffee, Marty. <laughs> uh, so let me back up then. Pentecost is a Jewish holiday that comes 50 days, hence the word penta in Pentecost. It means 50. It comes 50 days after the Jewish holiday of Passover that most people know about. Passover celebrates the Exodus event when Uh, Moses was sent by God many thousands of years ago now to deliver a nation of slaves. The the Israelites had been in slavery in Egypt. And God, in compassion, one day said to a man named Moses, Moses, I'm calling you. I've heard the cries of my people. I'm concerned about their suffering, and I'm sending you to deliver them. And a a great event happened, and the um, sort of penultimate or the ultimate moment of that event was the, um, the Passover night when, after a series of plagues, came on the king of Egypt telling him, let my people go to worship me. Uh, eventually, there was one final plague that would involve the death of, that, of all the firstborn sons. And the Israelites were told, take a lamb and prepare the lamb for dinner. Um, when you do that, capture all the blood and and take the blood and and sort of paint the doorpost of your house with it, when the judgment of God comes through and sees the the houses with blood over the doorpost, the angel will pass over your house and you'll be protected. That was called Passover. That happened. They left Israel. They became, I mean, they left Egypt, became a nation. Do you know this story? Okay. Well, 50 days later, um, the Lord met them at Mount Sinai where he gave the law, the law of Moses. The nation was formed at that time. And on Pentecost, the Jewish people celebrate the forming of Israel as a nation and the giving of the law of Moses, if you didn't know that. That's the day of Pentecost. It's celebrated this day. Well, on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus was crucified, he being the Passover lamb, the ultimate one that all Passover is pointed to prophetically, after he was crucified on Passover, Raised from the dead on the first day of the week, three days later, there was the following 50 days, the Jewish Feast of Pentecost, and on that day, God did something altogether new, wherein the first Pentecost was about God establishing his covenant with his people. This day of Pentecost was about God establishing his new covenant with people, where he poured out the Holy Spirit in fulfillment of promises, centuries-old promises, poured out his Holy Spirit. People were baptized, immersed in the Holy Spirit. They spoke in other tongues. They prophesied. Lots of miracles happened, and the church was really born. And so every year at Pentecost, we look forward to that time. This year, we are especially looking forward to the need for the church of Jesus Christ to be baptized afresh with the Holy Spirit, empowered to the works of Jesus. Therefore, we're in a series of about six messages leading up to Pentecost that are all about who the Holy Spirit is, what he does, what he does in us. And so you've experienced that, some of you. The first week, we talked about just who the Holy Spirit is as a revealer of who Jesus is, who the Father is, a revealer through the writing of the Bible. Um, 
the second week, last week, we talked about the throne in my heart. The idea being that a key to preparing for a Pentecost experience, a key to living a life that is spirit-filled, is repenting of anything that replaces Jesus on the throne of my life. Do you remember that? The throne in my heart. The idea that was mentioned today during worship, that we belong, oh, and mentioned in Lisa's prayer, we belong to God. He is king. He is Lord. And any time I put myself on the throne of my life, that's an area that I need to change some things. I need to repent. That process is that process is very helpful for uh, preparing for an infilling of the Holy Spirit. The, today, in our third session, we're going to be talking about um, and maybe doing a, just kind of touching the surface of equipping training for us to be aware of a calling on each of your lives for a ministry that you're called to. And that's the ministry of bringing healing and wholeness to hurting people. And uh, Amy referred to that when she was leading worship near the end there. And this topic is for every single one of you. Whether you are old as a follower of Jesus, or whether you were once a follower of Jesus and you walked away and you're just kind of barely returning, or whether you're brand new, whether you're today going to become a follower of Jesus, wherever you are in the process, you are invited into some amazing things. So the, um, the gospel or the good news of the kingdom is kind of in short form the idea that now, because of Jesus coming, all people can enter into God's kingdom life simply by relationship with Jesus, a faith relationship. In the past, um, you could read in this in the, in the Deuteronomy book in the Old Testament, um, it says something like this, if we are able to obey all these laws, that will be our righteousness. I'm quoting Deuteronomy 6. In this new covenant, there's not quite so much work on our part. <laughs> Jesus, the Son of God, has done all the work, and we are invited simply by relationship with him to enter into the fullness of God's covenant and relationship and kingdom life and the life of eternity. That's the simplicity of the message. Some people say the gospel they think is the gospel of the cross. You know, Jesus died for your sins. If you put your faith in him, your sins will be forgiven and you'll go to heaven when you die. And that's true, but that's just a small part of it. The fuller picture is the fullness of his kingdom. You with me? Okay. So one, one way to look at it is in terms of healing. And ultimately... The story of this gospel of the kingdom includes a healing of my entire life experience. Spiritually, there's healing with forgiveness of sins, with cleansing of sins and their effects. There's healing for relationships that are broken because of sin. Did you know relationships get broken because of sin? Yeah, you know that. Okay. There's healing emotionally. There's healing spiritually. And in fact, some of the biblical words for healing, a big one that I'm thinking of is the Greek word sozo, is translated into English as healing, as salvation, for emotional healing, for deliverance from evil spirits, for the whole gamut. So this, this promise of the gospel of the kingdom for you and me, is to enter into wholeness. That's a huge part of it. Another the aspect that I'm referring to today, more specifically, and that I just said a moment ago, is that all of us who are called to follow Jesus and enter into this experience of coming into wholeness are also called to join him in bringing that healing power to everyone around us. You have a calling on your life. 
And if you will find yourself walking in that purpose, you're going to find so much more fulfillment and joy. It's, it's, it's one thing to get better yourself, but it's a lot better to not only get better, but to help other people get better by leading them to Jesus and ministering in the area of healing. You, you ready to learn some stuff about this? Let's go. Uh, let's ask God to help us, Lord. <laughs> we need your help. We want to be all and everything that you want us to be. We want to experience the fullness of this new life in Jesus. And we say, yes, you are Lord. We want to follow you anywhere you lead us. We want to hear what you've written through your Holy Spirit in the revelation of your word about what we're called to do and be. And we want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do and be everything you've called us to do and be. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's see. A couple thoughts are coming to my mind that I should mention. Let me guess. Um, most of you in this room I know, most of you have become followers of Jesus. Most of you have experienced something you call salvation. But I don't think that I know any of you who have achieved perfection yet. <laughs> Am I right? If you have, I'd like to yield the pulpit <laughs> to that one. So... You've been forgiven and cleansed of sins, but sometimes you still are working out some issues with some sinning. This, yeah? So that has never slowed you down in believing about the forgiveness of sins and salvation. You understand, as we've said many times, biblically speaking, we were saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. Like when Jesus returns, so we're in between, right, the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus, and we all have hope that when he returns, it's going to be consummated, and we'll have this, like, really complete salvation. Healing is very much the same way. And for some of us, for many of us, especially in Western Christianity, when we hear about physical healing, we think, oh, all or nothing, Right? If we don't get completely healed, it must not be a healing. But that's not biblically how it works. Very, there, there are miracle situations, and surely in your salvation experience, many of you have miracle stories. You're not complete, but you are a lot, right? In physical healing that we're called to, spiritual healing, emotional healing, there is a lot, sometimes complete, sometimes it's a long process. And don't, so I, I just want to, that thought came to me, I should tell you up front, we're going to be talking about the ministry of healing, including praying for sick people in their bodies, diseased sick people. But know that the truth is we are in a war and there's often a battle for healing. And we need to engage in that battle rather than just throw up the white flag and say, well, I guess God isn't doing that anymore today. I'll do something else. There are a lot of broken hurting people in our lives, and we are called to engage them with the goodness and the power of God for bringing wholeness to their brokenness. And a, a language I've used over the years is, I would love to see the church that I'm part of be an army of healers. I'd love for us to be a place where people that are hurting go, well, I know that at least those people pray for hurting people. I'm going to go see them. And I know that sometimes miracles happen, and sometimes processes happen where people get better over a long haul. So that's kind of what we're talking about today. Um, that and a, and a bunch more. What I'm going to first do is try to bring to our understanding and our faith the reality that, that the gospel that you and I are called to, that most of you know because you've read this book, includes proclaiming the good news and doing the works of healing. And you may not have seen this before. You may have. If you have, it'll encourage you. If you haven't, it might be a revelation to you. Um, I'll, I'll read some things to you, but I'll just say the, the end game of what I'm about to read is 
that all of us are actually called to the ministry of healing. In fact, it's an issue of obedience for followers of Jesus. And most people I know in evangelical Christianity somehow have been blinded to this. And when I say it, pastors, they're like, I never saw that before. I I didn't realize. Whoa. So just kind of some steps. Jesus calls 12 people, you know them, the disciples, and he sends them out to preach and heal, always preach and heal. Here's Matthew chapter 10. He called Jesus, his 12 disciples to him, gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal disease and sickness. As you, and then he sends them out, and I'm skipping a few verses, verse 7. As you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near, heal the sick. You see, there's like no, it's just hardly a breath. Preach this message, heal the sick, raise the dead. Oh, that sounds impossible, so we'll just ignore that, right? Oh, no, okay. Cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely have you received, freely give. Later, he grabs 72 unnamed disciples, and the Holy Spirit saw fit to make sure this was in your Bible. Thousands of years later, all through the church age, people have been reading these words. He calls 72 people. Let's see how he, what he tells them. Because you might be thinking, the 12 apostles, yeah, they did the healing stuff. But the 72, after this, the Lord appointed, uh, Luke chapter 10, 72 others, sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he's about to go. Skipping now some verses for time. Verse 9, he says, to these 72, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. There's always preaching and demonstration, always preaching and demonstration over and over. After his resurrection, so Jesus dies, the disciples are distraught, they're hiding in fear, they're hiding in a room. He shows up, it's recorded in John's Gospel in chapter 20. On the evening of the first day of the week, this is the day of the resurrection, when the disciples were together, the doors locked for fear of the Jews, the Jews that had just killed Jesus, their master. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed him his hands and his feet. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. This is, this is the pattern. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. As the Father, th- this is maybe a hard pill for you to swallow. <laughs> but listen, I'm telling the truth. In the same way that the Father sent Jesus with a ministry... He is sending you who are followers of Jesus with that same ministry in the same way. In the same way. You have an assignment. You have a mission. So the ultimate place where we know this is for you and me is in Matthew 28. Jesus is getting ready to ascend to the Father Matthew records it. The disciples, 11 of them, gather on a mountain. He gives what is now known as the Great Commission to the 12 and to the whole church. His words are this. Jesus came to them and said, All authority, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I am king. I've accomplished it. All authority. Therefore, since all authority has been given to me, you go and make disciples of every nation, disciples, those who are students of of Jesus learning to do what he did. Apprentices, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And here's how this applies directly, unequivocally, unmistakably to you and me today, teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. And we just read that he commanded them, go preach this gospel and heal the sick. And he said, disciples, make disciples who obey everything that I commanded you first, 12 disciples. Go preach this gospel, this good news of the availability of the kingdom of God through relationship in Jesus and heal sick people. This, when, when I discovered this, my, my mind changed a bit from some people seem especially gifted by God to pray for sick people to this is a matter of obedience. If I'm going to obey Jesus, i got to pray for sick people. 
because I'm an obedient person. I try to be an obedient person. Whether I want to or not, because sometimes I don't want to. Whether I feel like it or not, because often I don't feel like it. Whether I think I'm gifted or not is irrelevant. I am called to tell people who Jesus is, and I'm called to heal people. And I can't heal people, so that's kind of frustrating. Anyone relate to that? But I can at least obey what Jesus told me to do, and surprisingly enough, he flows through me at least at times and brings healing to the brokenness of people. Um, maybe a story. Do you like stories? <laughs> I'm just, I was thinking back as I was preparing this to different stories. One time, a friend of mine, this has happened so many times over the years, called me with the bad news that his daughter, whose age I can't remember, and I won't use any names because I didn't call him and say, can I tell the story? And I don't think there's a privacy issue, but anyway. Daughter is in the hospital. She has a serious infection. She's unconscious right now. She's not expected to live. I think it was meningitis. Um, And she was probably around 16, if I remember right. Will you come and pray? Now, I, I feel no special anointing to go and pray, but I have some compassion. So I go to the hospital. I think it was in Encinitas. It's been a few years now. And I if I recall right, there's the room outside, like the ICU kind of room, where there's the person who's got all the wires, you know, and all the machines, and, the, you know, it's just beeping and all that. Unconscious, you know, the oxygen, whatever, the whole thing. You've seen the picture, right? You've been there? She's going to die. I'm there to comfort the dad. But let's go in and pray for her. So we go in and pray for her. Put hands on this lifeless body. She's not dead, but she's supposed to die. We simply do what Jesus said to do. Lay hands. Ask for the Holy Spirit to come and minister. And the weirdest thing happened. All of a sudden, all the machinery started going. It seemed like crazy. We were looking at each other. What, did we do something wrong? Because it's beeping and blinking and lighting and ding, ding, ding. And people start coming in. And, you know, like it just came to life, all the, all the monitoring machinery. And she got completely healed. I mean, it was awesome. She's... This is a number of years ago. She lives in, in the south of the United States right now as a mother to a number of kids, a great wife. I was at her wedding. You know, it's just a joy to see death overcome with life because someone just obeyed the call to pray. You understand that? I'm pretty sure if no one prayed for her, she would have died. You understand that part? God loves people. He loves to bring healing. He has chosen his wisdom to partner with you and me to accomplish his will in this earth. Rarely does he just do it on his own. But he grabs people. Okay, so I'm going to give you just a few principles in this talk and and some instruction. But I want you to know this first principle. Well, the first principle was your call. Second principle is that biblically... Salvation is seen as a integrated process, body, soul, and spirit process, and integrated. The Bible doesn't, and the biblical view doesn't separate us kind of into a, a few different parts that are kind of rattling around inside our body, and we're all like separate, and you kind of touch each one as a specialist individually. We do that, but the Bible more sees people as an integrated whole where every different dimension that we can describe interacts with the other dimensions, and there needs to be an integrated approach to healing. I'll try to describe that more if you have no idea what I just said. But here's a quote from a, a guy that I really, I really respect. His name is Lloyd Ogilvie. He was the chaplain to the United States Senate for a while. He used to pastor a church in Hollywood called Hollywood Presbyterian Church. He also wrote a commentary on the book of Acts. He also is the editor of a whole commentary series. In his commentary on the book of Acts, Lloyd Ogilvie wrote this. It's going to echo what I said before and then amplify it a little bit. Preaching the gospel and the ministry of healing are inseparable. When healing is understood in the deeper context of salvation, wholeness, 
health, and ultimate well-being, we can practice both preaching and healing as part of Christ's ministry through us. We, we are lost apart from God physically, emotionally, in the soul realm, in the spirit realm. And God brings healing to all, all of those dimensions. Just for convenience, we've seen the division or the mention of body, soul, and spirit. And I just want to mention that briefly. Remember, we are dead, broken, needing wholeness and healing spiritually because we've been separated from God by our sin. We've also been separated from each other by our sin. So just the act of being forgiven of sins is a healing, and it's part of what you and I are called to minister to. But we're also broken as a result of sin and the work of Satan emotionally. Did you notice in our world today the preponderance of emotional health issues. And just, we're surrounded by emotional and mental health issues. And that has a lot to do with the, the realm of the soul. We're, we are broken um, into dysfunction in our families, relationally, with our employers, with our neighbors. There's so much brokenness in the realm of the soul separated from each other with selfishness, with jealousy, with envy, with bitterness, with all those issues. There's healing for all of that. And when we use biblical terminology to talk about ministering healing, we include all of that. So I just want us to understand integrated wholeness. Physical sickness, then, is often interrelated to soul issues and spiritual issues. Very often... The physical healing that someone needs is directly related to, for example, the need to be uh, giving forgiveness and moving away from bitterness and resentment for something that happened to them. That's often the case. And as you enter into the ministry of healing, you will learn to help people in an integrated, whole way meet these needs. Did that make any sense? Yeah. Okay, so here's a scripture reference that refers to that. This is Paul's letter to the Thessalonian church. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus. The one who has called you is faithful. Remember I said process. So much of the healing that I need comes not only in the moment of the touch of God, but it also comes through the process of relationship connected to you in the body of Christ with many experiences in God's word, in caring for each other, in fellowship around meals. There's growth and healing in all of that. So you have people in your life who are separated from relationship, not only just naturally, but with God. And you have a role to bring wholeness to them, maybe for the, the presenting problem of serious headaches. But it, it might be involved more with not only praying for that condition, but inviting them into relationship with God and you and the family of God. So I'm just, I want you to understand process. Involved in that, you might be called to cast demons out of people because that can be a problem. Big serious problem. You understand? See, it's all, healing is all of this. You are called to this ministry. And you also, I want to remind you, are in a process. Let me tell you another story. This is from my family life, a friend of our family um, that I just remembered last night that took a long process. And 21 years ago, I had the foresight to write down some of the process. We had a friend. Um, who was pregnant at the same time Kim was pregnant. And on, no, on September 2nd, so I'm going to tell you dates so you can see process. September 1st, I'm sorry, she had to have an emergency C-section to deliver the baby who had severe meconium aspiration. In other words, the fecal matter in the womb was brought into the lungs and it was a severe problem, emergency C-section. They were told very little chance of survival for the baby. So we prayed for that. Well, by the 2nd of September, the doctor said, okay, the chances of survival are now at 50%. Things have improved. So is there healing? 
But is there healing? No. So there's both healing and not healing. Because it's a battle, people. There's a battle against the works of Satan. There's a battle against sickness. There's a battle against all these things. So we continue to pray. He was on one of those ECMO machines that does the breathing. On the 6th of September, he had severe bleeding in the gut, so he had to be removed from the ECMO um, that was doing the oxygen transfer for his blood. Twelve hours before this, they did a test and said he was no near, no way near ready to get off this machine. So we prayed, and he got off the machine, and he was doing okay without the ventilator. On the 7th, the severe internal bleeding in his intestine stopped. We are praying every day for this baby. On the 8th, we were told that severe pulmonary hypertension was getting worse. They were having a hard time getting oxygen in his blood. Two days later, after prayer, he suddenly was heading in the right direction with the pulmonary hypertension. By the 14th, that thing had been pretty much healed because we prayed and prayed and prayed. Do you see, it's, you don't give up. You keep going. On the 15th, so now we're 15 days later, his parents got to hold him for the first time. 22nd, my notes say he's completely off the ventilator now, so ECMO and then ventilator. Uh, a month later, a month, two months later really, October 26th, he went home. So he's the same age as my daughter. He's 21, and he's doing great today. But it took the body of Christ battling in a process of prayer, just like you battle in the process of salvation. You were called to this battle. Okay, how you doing? Okay, and just note, this is, by the way, just scratching the surface. Um, if you're interested in book reading, I always give you a book recommendation, right? One of the best books, and I'm maybe, at least in my um, foundational thinking for this talk, think, referring to some of his thoughts, is a um, book by a guy who was local, a Canadian, but he used to live in Rancho Bernardo, who lives now in um, maybe Fallbrook. His name is Ken Blue, like the color blue, and he wrote a book in the 80s called Authority to Heal. I cannot, highly, I cannot recommend highly enough this book if you're interested in growing and healing. I have to find it at a, at a used bookseller online, like Abe Books. Um, authority to heal. So, got to give him credit. Here's some principles, and these are derived from some of his thoughts. You're called to healing ministry because you're called to follow Jesus. If you haven't followed Jesus yet today, I'm going to invite you to follow Jesus with your life today. When you do, you're going to enter into a process of becoming whole yourself, and you're going to enter into the calling of bringing wholeness to other people. And if you're getting your life to Jesus, giving your life to Jesus today, you can this afternoon pray for someone. Okay, so there's no, no, no wait time. You'll get better over the years as you grow, but you can start today. Do you understand that? You were called to bring wholeness, and you're going to enjoy it. Can you imagine what it's like when you get to participate in bringing restoration to an extremely broken life? It's incredibly joyful. It's your calling. Okay, so here's principle number one. It's important that you be confident that it's God's will to bring people into wholeness. And that may seem like a crazy thing to say for you. I don't know where you are, but there are many people, especially in Western Christianity, that have bought into an idea about maybe God wants to teach me a lesson and it'd be better for me to be sick and diseased. You may have heard that. I've heard it many times. The idea is, you know, God wants to teach me something. So the reason I have cancer is because God gave it to me to teach me um, patience and faith. That's a common thought. The truth is God can use anything for his purposes. But if we would take a time reading through the scriptures, it is clear through the life of Jesus that God doesn't like sickness. He doesn't like disease. And every time Jesus encountered it, he healed it. And he never, 
ever told someone who said, Jesus, would you heal me? He never said, now, friend, (laughs) this sickness is for your blessing. Never did it. If you think that God sends sickness to help train people, you might be inclined not to believe that he wants them well. Your faith and your hope are going to be diminished. So get a hold of the fact that God likes to heal people. Look at this verse, Acts 10. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. We're talking about the anointing of you and me with the Holy Spirit and power. Here's the example for us. God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Another um, great writer about healing is a guy by the name of Francis McNutt. Man, he wrote way back in the 70s a couple books. But in one of them, he quotes, he doesn't name the friend, but he quotes a friend that makes this observation. Every time you meet Jesus in the Gospels, he's either actually healing someone or has just come from healing someone or is on his way to healing someone. He's always healing. He is willing. Uh, How about this? Mark 1 Beginning of Mark's gospel, a man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Again, Jesus doesn't say, well, um, this, this, healing, this, this disease, leprosy, is really going to teach you patience. God's trying to teach you something, and you're not learning it yet, so we're just hoping that you stay sick. No, he said these words, I am willing. And he was filled with compassion, reached out his hand, Be clean, and immediately the man was healed. So the first thing is, just know it's God's will to bring people into wholeness, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Second thing, I've already told you, know that you're called to be in the ministry of healing. Third thing, cultivate a heart of love and compassion for hurting people. So that when you see someone who's hurting In any kind of brokenness, disease, sickness, emotionally, spiritually, that your heart goes out to them. You don't think of them as an object for something that you should accomplish and fix, but you see them as a human, fellow human being hurting, and you let compassion and love well up in your heart for them. Jesus, frequently when we read about him, was moved to the depths of his being, the Bible says, with compassion, and therefore did his ministry. It is not true that he healed people to prove that he was God. It is true that he healed people because he was God, and God is full of compassion, mercy, and power. So what do we have? One, belief. No, get convinced God likes to make people better. Two, know that you're called. Three, develop a heart of compassion and love. Four, don't fall prey to the common thinking of a faith formula approach to ministry. A faith formula is sort of the idea that comes from American can-do attitude that there's always a cause and effect, and if I can just work up enough faith, enough believing that the thing that I want to accomplish will be accomplished, and by using faith, I can manipulate God to do what I want him to do. They would never say that, but that is kind of the message that comes across. In this idea, faith is a psychological absence of any doubt. If you can convince yourself that something's going to happen, surely it will happen and God will have to do it. Don't fall prey to that thinking. The kind of faith that you see in the Bible where frequently is mentioned, this person experiences um, a healing and Jesus says, according to your faith, be it unto you. Faith is the concept and the context of relationship with God where I trust him and believe that he's good. Jesus went into his own town and could do no good works amongst them. He was surprised. He just healed a few people. It wasn't that he needed their moral support or he had some legalistic thing about, well, if you just believed enough, you'd get healed. No, there was no context of relationship and trust in him for healing. So they couldn't experience it. Healing in faith is much more of a relationship of I trust that God is good. My faith is in you and I trust that you're powerful. 
So I'm going to enter into what you've called me to do and what I've been called to receive. I could talk a lot more about that, but time won't let me. Um, Just understand, you are not called to either have or not have a gift of healing. You are called to be a vessel through whom God flows. So it's not up to me to do anything but be present and obey Jesus and do what he said to do, putting my hands on sick people to bless them and pray for them, inviting his spirit to come and minister. One, one time I was at a, um, one of our small groups, and there was a, we were in the kitchen. We weren't in the right prayer time. You know, the, the, the situation wasn't the, the cultivation of all the faith. We didn't worship. We were, it was like eating. And there was a lady there who had um, such severe fibromyalgia that she was always swollen. In, in a moment, without like a lot of prayer, I just put my hand on her, thinking maybe God will bless her. Instantly, her swelling went down so fast that her ring fell off her finger to the floor. And she went, look at that. We picked up her ring. There was not a lot of faith. But there was a lot of presence. And God touched her that day and encouraged her. And she's still struggling, by the way. So the process is still going. But God's power was present. And I'm so glad I had just a little bit of belief that maybe God would want to touch her. It was very interesting. So what do we have? Be convinced God loves people and wants them whole. It's not like into their sickness. He's not like some kind of abuser. Secondly, that you're called to bring healing to broken people. Third, have compassion. What was the fourth one? Oh, don't fall prey to the the faith formula. And five, create in your life opportunities to take time to minister to people in healing. Take the time. Do you know if someone that you know is having trouble, even physically, you could say, you know, why don't you come over for dinner? I'd love to get to know you more. Have an evening. Hear their story. Offer to pray. Take time. Say, I think God wants to help you. Could I pray for you? Maybe tonight God will touch you. As you're listening to their story, Be listening to God and say, God, what do you think is the cause of this that we can pray for? Is it emotional? Do I need to help them come to forgiveness? Is there issues of sin? They need to be receiving salvation. Is there a demonic force that I need to drive out? Is it just brokenness in their body that you want to touch miraculously? Figure that all out. Invite the Spirit of God to come and touch them. And no hurry. Loving, relationally. Invite the presence of God and wait and watch. You take your time. And the next thing you know, you are praying prayers of faith. Sometimes prayers that say things like, legs stop hurting in Jesus' name. A command of faith. Sometimes you're saying, God, I don't know what to do. Please come and help my friend. But you're engaging patiently with time. You've got to take time. It is true that we can go out on the streets and do kind of hit-and-run prayer, and, and good things happen, but never quite the same as the development of relationship and love and taking your time. You're called to this, and now you're responsible because you listened to the whole thing I just said. Like, you can't get out of it now. You're going to run into some hurting people in your life. They're already there, probably. And now you're stuck. You're going to hear my, <laughs> my Mr. Rogers voice echoing in your ears. <laughs> Be a good neighbor. <laughs> yeah, sing this song. Um, I said it before, but I want to say it again. Imagine that you and I are part of a community where pretty much everybody, all the time, sees a need and takes time to pray into it. And people 
are having wholeness and healing all around us. So much so that people know if they are hurting, they can come to this community and someone's going to love them. Someone's going to care. Someone's going to take the time. Someone's going to pray. Okay, so that's, that's it for today's equipping, training, teaching, a little look in the Bible. But we'd be remiss if we didn't practice what we preach, right? So instead of today, I'm going to invite the worship team, and they're going to, you know, um, worship Jesus and create an atmosphere where we really are just in the presence of God with um, our hearts, our minds, our souls. But this is an opportunity today for everyone to get in the game. Everyone gets to play. Everyone gets to handle the football today. <laughs> and I don't know what's happening in the room, but perhaps you're here and you could use a healing touch. And perhaps you're bold enough that you would let some people in this room gather around you and practice healing prayer. Holy Spirit, I want to ask you right now to rest on us, to empower us to step more fully into our calling. Come, Holy Spirit. So, so here's what I, I'm just to invite you to do. I don't know if there's going to be zero participation or 100%. We'll see. If you are here and you have something wrong with you physically, emotionally, spiritually, and you'd like to take a risk to let people pray over you, risking that maybe you'll be disappointed, but you're willing to take the risk that maybe you'll get really touched today. If that's you, would you stand up? around the room. You need physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing. Is there anyone? Okay, there's one, two, three, four, five. Over there, okay. Oh, in the wheelchair, Jennifer. You're going to love Jennifer. I just met her this week. What a incredibly sweet person. Um, now, the rest of you, I want to ask you because these people have just invited you, and you're all responsible now. Unless you have like an appointment you got to get to, I want to ask you to step out in faith and gather around these folks in at least two per person. At least each person has at least two of you praying for them, or maybe three or four. Don't get a gang of ten; that's too many. Um, maybe four at the most, possibly five. Go to them. And do what I just told you to do. Find out what their condition is. Take your time. Once you've listened to their condition and you've listened to the Lord, figure out how you're going to pray. Then invite God's Spirit to rest on them. Invite the Holy Spirit to minister to them. And wait a little bit and watch what the Holy Spirit does because we're in the process of blessing what God's doing. When you pray, Holy Spirit, would you come and minister to this to Tia right now? Let your spirit rest on her. And you watch. You'll probably see a change because God's going to answer that prayer. You'll recognize something tangible happened. The presence of God just got to work. You pay attention to what he's speaking to you. You ask her what she, he's speaking to her, if anything. And you pray into that. And you pray God's blessing on the condition. You standing up, Tutti? So I've got one here. You guys good to go? Yeah? Stand up and get to work. Body of Christ, doing the ministry of healing. You are now on the clock. This is overtime. <laughs> Come around these people and pray for them. Father, I pray that you will now release upon us the power of the Spirit of God to do your work of healing and restoration. Your Spirit come. The rest of you, if, if you haven't given your life to Jesus today, today's the day to call and say, Jesus, I give you my life. I want to follow you. We hope you've enjoyed this message. This weekly podcast is available on our website, gracevcf.org, where you can learn more about Grace Vineyard and our vision for people everywhere to know and worship God.